All right, welcome back. Uh, video two of week five of uh, Physics 325, Optics. Uh, last video we talked about Fourier analysis, how we add up harmonic functions uh, to make kind of any arbitrary shape of functions. And we saw that we could do that in terms of space and in terms of time. This week is all about time, and we're going to start using those results to deal with polychromatic fields. So let's start with some definitions and de-jargonize it. What do I mean polychromatic fields? Well, before we had our nice plane wave, right? It had a single frequency, and we called that a monochromatic field, one color, one frequency, uh, and it was given by, by this nice simple expression here. We found that since it satisfied the wave equation, we had this velocity, which we occasionally called the phase velocity, the velocity of a wave front or a phase front as it propagated, and that was just given by uh, omega over k. Now, in free space, we had k was equal to 2 pi over, that's a very funny 2, uh, 2 pi over lambda naught. And then in a medium, lambda went to lambda over n. So that was lambda over n. That's n 2 pi over lambda naught, which is n k naught. We called that k. So in a medium, uh, whatever this k that we had before, we multiply by n. We have n k in the medium we get that the velocity is equal to omega over k again, or omega over n k naught. Omega over k naught is c, so that's c over n. That's stuff we already knew from, from Snell's law. Now that's great, but as we alluded to, you don't really see too many perfect plane waves in nature. Most, actually all, in some sense, fields are, uh, are, are polychromatic. They have more than one frequency component. And this has to do with something that we're going to study uh, in video three, namely that a uh, monochromatic field would have actually had to have been left on forever to be truly monochromatic. So we can't really have a monochromatic field. We're going to have a spread in frequencies. So that leads to the idea of our polychromatic field. Now we saw last time we can talk about individual frequency components. Uh, we can write the field that way, or a continuum of frequencies. Uh, we can have a distribution of different frequencies about kind of a common center frequency. For example, this laser pointer, it's pretty monochromatic compared to a lot of light, but it still has a fairly broad range of frequencies of, I would guess, uh, a few hundred megahertz um, around its central frequency. So that sets the stage. Let's move on to the implications of that. So first thing we're going to notice is this phenomenon of dispersion. Remember that from before we had n was a function of, we had n it was a function of frequency. We had uh, this dispersion curve, we had an absorption curve, and uh, this told us that, remember what's plotted here is frequency, that we we're going to have a different index of refraction for different wavelengths, or equivalently different frequencies. And an application of this is that Snell's law, remember, that the amount of light that, uh, the amount that a beam bends, is now wavelength dependent. So blue, which has a different frequency from red, will have a different angle in a medium because of this dependence on frequency and the index of refraction. And here's a, a picture I pick, pulled up from a presentation we saw about colors and how they work last week, um, uh, given by Gavin, Jack, and Nathan. Uh, and we have Isaac Newton here breaking white light into its, into its spectrum uh, with a prism. This is solely because light bends at an angle that is governed by the ratio of indices of refraction. And we see here light is being bent, and also someone's mind is being blown, or they're about to karate chop Isaac Newton in the back. I can't tell what's going on in that picture, but something interesting. And the point is that uh, light is bending at an interface uh, by a different amount based on the amount of, or based on its frequency, rather. So here's a, an animation of what that looks like. So we have some incoming white light of all frequencies. It hits an interface, and it bends differently. The red bends differently from the green, which is different from the blue. And we just simulate this, and we can see that uh, we're actually going to get this rainbow effect as the blue is shifted down more than the red is shifted. Um, they're all shifting down because they're entering a more dense medium, but we get more refraction from one color than, a, than another, and as a result we can split up light into its constituent co uh, colors. All right, so most materials have some dispersion. So any material that has resonances, which is all materials, will have some dispersion. And this is what a typical dispersion looks like for a typical optical glass. This is BK7 optical glass, which is used uh, in a lot of experiments, uh, and it has a dispersion curve that looks like this. So it doesn't change too much, but it changes, and this will give us uh, that prism-like effect. And just some nomenclature, whenever you see either n as a function of lambda or omega as a function of k, 
they call that a dispersion curve or a dispersion relation. So here's a dispersion curve for, shot, uh, for that glass. So this, uh, all this Snell's law stuff, this splitting a light uh, via the prism effect, happens when you come at an angle. Even if you're going at a normal incidence, though, you still get very interesting things happening. You have the fact that different frequencies travel at different speeds, and this has some neat implications. Okay, uh, Namely, there's going to be a different kinds of velocities that we can talk about. Let's consider just to baby steps. We're going to start off with a very simple case of two frequencies, we'll move to a continu continuum of frequencies later. Uh, but for two frequencies, we can look at these uh, frequencies, omega 1 and omega 2. It's polychromatic. We have two frequencies, not one. Uh, these are collinear, so that they're moving in the same direction here. They're both moving in the z direction. But k1 is not equal to k2 because k also depends on the wavelength, right? Uh, the frequency and the wavelength, well, we have it written here. k is 2 pi over lambda. So the k's will have the same direction, but they'll have different magnitudes. And we'll let the direction be in the z hat direction. So the dot product simplifies, so it becomes this. Or we can use cosines or sines. Ha six and one, half a dozen in the other. We'll use whichever one is convenient. Okay, so let's look at this uh, a bit again in more detail. And we're going to apply one of these funny, uh, obscure trig identities that we can talk about the cosine of A plus the cosine of B in terms of the product of uh, two cosines uh, this way. Feel free to prove that. Uh, just one of those things that you learn in high school and forget, like I did. Let's apply that to, the th to our arguments for our cosines, and we get uh, this. We get these terms that kind of balloon out this way. Now let's just simplify things. We actually have the product of two waves, and we can identify some things here. One of the terms has a difference in the k's and the difference in the omegas. I'll call that kg and omega g. And the other one has a sum for uh, kp and omega p. So p in this case stands for phase. And the g's, uh, it turns out we're going to call the group velocity or the gr and the uh, group k vector. Okay, So writing it this way, we have uh, this expression here in terms of kg, kp, omega g, and omega p, Okay, which is the sum and differences of the two terms. Basically the sum, the difference over 2, and the average. Okay. Let's play with this a bit further. And remember that this expression, whatever it is, our, our waves satisfy the wave equation. So there's a particular velocity here. And each of these two terms corresponds to a wave with a different velocity. You see that? So it's a product of two waves which have different velocities. Uh, the group velocity, in this case, is omega g over kg. And the phase velocity is omega p over kp. So let's try to get an intuition and see what this actually means, what it looks like. Okay, so suppose that for now um, they're pretty close. So like, so we have omega is a, I don't know a billion hertz, and uh, omega two is a billion plus a million hertz. So 0.1 percent different. So they're going to have different frequencies, but the difference is going to be small uh, compared to the absolute value, right? So in this case, we can write omega p uh, as two omega plus capital omega divided by two, and since We've assumed the difference, big omega here, is much smaller than the, the original frequency. We can just write that approximately as omega. So the omega phase is about equal to omega. Uh, the group, on the other hand, is the difference, which is just literally the difference of the, these two waves divided by 2. So let's, let's have a look at this. Let's observe it at a fixed location. z equals 0. It doesn't really matter. And we can use cos of negative x equals cos of x. This is what we get. We get the product. Oh, and uh, that t should not be a subscripted, and there should be a half. This is a disaster. So you get the idea. We get the uh, product of these two cosines, and uh, one of them is just the original cosine, and the other is this overall envelope, we call it. It's a much slower field uh, as it propagates, uh, and we call that the carrier. So I'm just going to write this correctly. What is meant to be written there is E0 not cosine omega phase t, which is approximately omega t, times 2 times cosine of this big omega over 2 t. And this is what we call the carrier, and this is the beat note. So this is going to be a much smaller overall ampl uh, uh, modulation of this very fast uh, cosine wave here. And note that because the group velocity uh, is the difference of two, two fields, it depends on which one is bigger than the other uh, compared to it in its relation with k. So we could have a negative group velocity uh, or a positive group velocity depending on how big omega 1 and omega 2 are, right, as we tune them. So let's visualize what that actually looks like, okay? So here we have uh, two waves, um, and 
they have omega-1 greater than omega-2, K1 greater than K2, and that leads to a positive group and phase velocity. So we have these two waves which are propagating, and we have this overall pattern, which is a beat frequency. It may be kind of hard to see by looking at this, so I've, we'll put some envelopes around it so you can kind of track what's going on there. You see that? The phase velocity is different than the group velocity. Group velocity is actually faster than the phase velocity here. Uh, the phase velocity is that little bar that's moving along, and the envelopes are actually moving faster. Now we could have had k1 uh, greater than k2, but omega1 less than omega2. There's some waves that correspond to that. And let's see what that looks like. That would give us a negative group velocity. Okay, and this is what that looks like. Now, we still have two fields which are propagating to the right here. Uh, but somehow the envelope is going backwards. Just so you can see that, let's put an envelope around it as well. And you can see the phase velocity, which is one of those blue sine waves, is actually still moving to the right, although the envelope, the overall pattern, is moving to the left. Very interesting, right? Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of a weird, mind-boggling thing. We can even have k1 greater than k2, but omega1 equal to omega2. Now, it's kind of a contrived example for optics. We can't do that because omega and k are related, but we can imagine waves that have that property. And in fact, we can do it optically with three fields. I just want to keep the continuation here. So let's look at what a zero group velocity would look like. Uh, now, that's kind of boggles the mind when you stare at that. Right? What's going on there? Again, let's put our envelope around here. Uh, it looks like it's moving, but if you, if you stare at the beats, the beat notes, they're not going anywhere. Although there's a phase pattern which is moving to the right. We'll put an uh, envelope around it again. You can really see that. You see the phase moving to the right? So you can have any combination of group, phase, uh, group and phase uh, velocity. We can have group velocity being zero, phase velocity being zero, phase velocity being positive, and the group being either positive or negative. All right? And that's just the signs of these two things. That's just a property. This is an equivalent expression of writing the sum of su a wave one and wave two. Right? It's equivalent to the product of these two waves. So let's generalize this. Let's consider uh, even more closely spaced waves, even a continuum. Remember that Fourier stuff we were talking about last time where we, we shrunk the spacing to, uh, to zero and it became a continuous frequency distribution? How do we generalize these concepts for, with, for that? Well, what we're going to do here is we're going to formally take the limit as that becomes a continuum. So, so let's look at, we have omega 1 is equal to omega plus delta omega. K1 is equal to K plus delta K. So omega 2 is equal to omega, and K2 is equal to K. So let's look at the two velocities. For the, for the phase velocity, phase velocity is not a problem, because we're going to go, we have omega 1 plus omega 2 over k1 plus k2, and that's equal to um, 2 omega plus delta omega over 2 omega, 2 k rather, plus delta k. And we'll take the limit as delta omega and therefore delta k, because they're related, it goes to zero. There's no L'Hopital's rule or any crazy stuff we have to do. This is going to give us a finite answer. That's just omega over k. And our phase velocity is therefore going to be just omega over k. So that's the definition of our phase velocity. Okay? So it's, it, de it depends on the ratio of, of omega and k. Okay? What about the group velocity? Group velocity is a little bit weirder, right? We have minus signs here. So we're going to get omega plus delta over omega delta. It's going to give us delta omega. And the del omegas are going to cancel out. Plus omega minus omega um, over delta k plus k minus k. And we're going to take the limit is delta omega goes to 0. And therefore delta k goes to 0. Well, that's going to become the slope, the derivative, d omega by dk. Okay, So the phase velocity. Uh, is the ratio of omega over k, and the group velocity is the derivative. It's the slope, right? So if we have a continuous curve, one of these dispersion relations, which we'll talk about in a second, um, uh, so we'll have k and omega, uh, the instantaneous point, that instantaneous point there is going to give us the phase velocity, so we'll have some kind of phase, positive phase velocity here. And the slope 
that d omega by dk is what gives us the group velocity, okay? So that depends on the slope. So let's take a few of the dispersion curves that we already know, right? So it's, here's a dispersion curve about an atom of an atom near resonance, right? If this is what the uh, susceptibility looks like. We can look at the index this way as well, and we can write this, and we can see some interesting things here. This is something you came across in your assignment. For lower frequencies, so-called to the red of the resonance, uh, we get some index of refraction that's, that's positive. Uh, for to the blue of the resonance, we seem to get an index of refraction which is, well, still positive rather, sorry, but it's, it's, it's less than one, meaning that it's, we get faster propagation in the medium than we did with, uh, uh, than we'd had if we had nothing there. But this is not a huge problem. This is a concept of the phase velocity and the phase velocity is just the, the velocity of a pattern. It's similar to if you shone a laser pointer on the moon and moved the, the pattern across. That pattern can travel faster than the speed of light, no problem. You're not transmitting information. It's just from your vantage point, you're looking at the pattern that it, it traces out as you shoot those photons to the moon. Or similarly, we can look at the intersection point of these books. And if I move the, the books up, the intersection point defines a pattern. That's like the phase velocity, the phase front here. And if I tilt that book ever more to the horizontal, that velocity gets higher and higher, it approaches infinity as I tilt it more, or even arguably negative to the other side. So the phase velocity does not convey information. So it's not a superluminal uh, propagation of a phase front is allowed. It's just the pattern that emerges like a laser pointer on the moon. Uh, so the group velocity is what matters. So we're safe, or are we? Because uh, if we look at this region here, uh, we can rewrite, let's rewrite this uh, expression in terms of the index of refraction, just from, from what we had before. Let's look at what we have here. We have k, which is um, omega over v, the, the, the wave vector, which is um, omega over c, times n uh, tells us that n omega is equal to c times k. All right, so I'm just trying to set this up because what we want to do is we want to calculate the group velocity. We want to calculate d omega by dk. So it turns out it's a bit easier just to take the derivative with respect to omega because we often specify n in terms of omega, then we'll just flip it. So we're going to go d by d omega of this whole thing. So that's going to give me dn by d omega times omega plus n times d omega by d omega, that's 1, is equal to c times dk by d omega. And I can divide that c to the other side, just like this. Let's flip them. Now, mathematicians, please avert your eyes. But I'm just going to flip this over. And it turns out for a nice behave function like this, this is legit d omega by dk is 1 over dk by d omega, and that's equal to c over n plus omega dn by d omega. Okay? And that's what we have uh, written here. So this is our group velocity in terms of the index of refraction. Okay. So it's c over n plus omega dn by d omega. Notice if we have no slope, if we have a flat dispersion curve, it's c over n, so the group velocity is equal to the phase velocity. But if we have some crazy slopes, well, in that case, um, we can have very different group velocities and phase velocities. Okay, and here's a troubling fact. We have a large uh, negative slope here, so that means that we have a superluminal group velocity. And the group velocity is, in some sense, conveying information. So uh, was Einstein wrong? What's going on here? Let's actually look at that. Let's dig into that a touch. So we have this phenomenon of fast light, all right? So here's a simulation of light going through uh, an atom, just as we've calculated before, and we have a pulse of light going through, all right? So we're going to look at it, and what's in orange is actually going through. So you see how it kind of shrinks in a way, and we're moving along with the pulse of light. So it might seem counterintuitive or even uh, illegitimate, but what we're moving, we're moving along at the speed of light. In other words, we're moving in what's called the co-moving frame with the pulse, so staying in the center means it's moving in the state of speed of light. Moving to the left means it's moving slower. Moving to the right means it's superluminal. 
and we can see the orange pulse gets absorbed in a funny way. It gets absorbed such, such that the front of it gets through, but the tail of it does not. Okay? And if you normalize it to one, if you ignore what's going on with the amplitude, indeed it looks like the peak of the pulse is moving faster than the speed of light. What's really happening is these dipoles, uh, they take a while to kind of spin up, so to speak, so the front of the pulse can get through. Uh, after, they, after those fields that we've been talking about uh, for the, in the first part of the course start, um, start generating their own fields, that's when the attenuation occurs. And so we get a, kind of an asymmetric absorption of the pulse. But if we kind of scale everything up to one, indeed it looks like we have a superluminal pulse. But if we really concentrate on what's going on at the front edge, no information is being traveled faster than the speed of light. So we're safe. And this is interesting. This has to do with the, the relation between the absorption and the dispersion. Okay, superluminal communication impossible, subluminal communication easy. And it turns out you can do that. Okay, so there's this phenomenon of slow light. This is a presentation that's coming up in a few weeks, so this will just be a teaser. But basically, we have a pulse of light that's going to go through a cloud of atoms, and we have a, a field, big omega, you usually call it, going through, which interferes with, this, with these dipoles in such a way to render the field transparent in a narrow window. This is called electromagnetically induced transparency, and it looks like this. When we turn on this field here, this omega, uh, we get a little transparency window opening where all the light goes through. What's better, look at there, we have a very, very, very steep positive slope. And plugging into, I shouldn't have erased it, but V group is equal to C over N plus omega, N prime of omega, we'll call it. If we have a very, very large, if this is huge, huge, uh, V group is going to be much, much less than C. So we'll have slow light. And it turns out people have done this. About 20 years now, ago now, uh, there was a publication where they showed light moving at 17 meters per second, uh, about as fast as you can ride your bike uh, if you're really pumping. So you can go faster than the speed of light if you're going down a hill on a bike. Very neat. Uh, so this is the phenomenon of slow light. I don't want to say too much about it because I know we have a presentation on it coming up. Uh, but this is just a reduced group velocity. Now, we can also do something very, very, very interesting. Imagine this board is the set of atoms, and we're sending the light through, and then we change this big omega here, this coupling field, as they call it, as it's going through, such that we reduce the transparency to a zero window. So the group velocity, it turns out, remember, it's, it has to do with the slope. We're going to make it very, very, very steep and infinitely steep at the end as that pulse is going through. And what's going to happen is the velocity of the pulse is going to go to zero, uh, like that. And then we'll open it back up at some time later, and it reaccelerates out. Stored light, a hard drive for photons. Uh, and this has been done too a few years back. And um, this is uh, some results where they stored images using electromagnetically induced transparency. It looks like uh, a second here, which is pretty amazing. Um, I worked on this stuff a few years back, and we were happy when we got 10 microseconds, but yeah, it's, it's come away. Um, and this is the phenomenon of stopped light, zero group velocity, and then re-emitted light uh, based on electromagnetically induced transparency. Very neat stuff. And uh, it's actually used, what's great about this is that the spins that we were talking about that did the absorption, they're actually capturing the information of the pulse. So what's very neat about this is if you encode quantum information, the superposition into the light, for example, in two frequencies or two polarizations, that is stored in the atoms and then released. It's caught and released uh, by these EIT memories, and therefore they form what's called a quantum memory, which is part of a quantum network. And tomorrow is technology. I have a colleague uh, in Stony Brook right now who's working on the first uh, commercial quantum repeater using electromagnetically induced transparency. Okay, again, that's, uh, again, as always, that's a lot of information, uh, but that's this lecture. Uh, let's summarize. So we had dispersion, which looks uh, at, it refers to the index of refraction, uh, which depends on frequency or wavelength, and it led to different bending of light uh, at different frequencies from Snell's law, and allowed us to make things like prisms. When we look longitudinally, even if the light is all going along in the same direction, we have two different velocities. We have the velocity of a phase front, which we call the phase velocity, omega over k, and the, velocity, the group velocity, which depends on the slope of this dispersion curve, uh, the group velocity, and that can be zero. Uh, positive or negative. Uh, finally, the, these, the group velocity can be related to the index of refraction in this way and can lead to slow, stopped, and reaccelerated light.
All right, that's it for today. Uh, next time we'll talk about coherence length, and that'll be it for the week.